Welcome to the Navit Gaming Podcast, where it is our mission to explore the business and future of video games. We bring together the industry's brightest builders, investors, and thinkers to keep a pulse on current events, dissect emerging trends and games, share lessons learned, and have a great time. This podcast is also part of Novik's growing ecosystem, which ranges from free and premium research to consulting and advisory services. For more information, visit www.novik.co. Now, let's jump into the episode. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Aaron Bush, and I'm delighted to be joined by Manish Agarwal, founder of IndieGG, which is a leading India-focused Web3 gaming guild. Manish, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Aaron. Lovely speaking to you. Look forward. Yeah, I think it's going to be a fun conversation today because today in this episode, we're going to discuss how guilds are rapidly evolving, the Web3 opportunity in India, Manisha's vision for IndieGG, how guilds partner with both players and game companies and much more. But let's go ahead and start with an introduction. Manish, can you tell us a bit about your previous role as CEO of Nazara Technologies, and then why you decided to leave that for NDGG. Aaron, uh, I would love to just tell you that why did I decide? Because uh, I am I have a curiosity of a kid, and uh, I get bored. So when <laughs> I have to do more and more of the same things, I need some new toys, new problems to solve. And that's what I've been doing in the last 20 years. Um, five, seven years spent, look at a multidimensional problems and then solve them. Uh, as Nazara, it was an amazing opportunity to work with everyone at Nazara, especially the Nazara founder, Nitish. Uh, we were working like a twin engine for eight years. We took company public. And uh, it's been an, it was an amazing, fulfilling journey of being the only listed gaming company in India. And uh, after that, uh, frankly, I was getting hugely uh, envious of people, of my friends globally who were in Web2 gaming now, but moving in Web3, they were talking about how the fundamental blockchain can disrupt. And I was kind of really running on treadmill from one quarter to another quarter as a publicly listed company CEO. And I said, hey, listen, I need to kind of really get down in the trenches as a builder again and, and kind of really get to some more butterflies in my stomach. And that's why I'm here. Awesome. Uh, yeah, great to hear. And being bored is often a much better reason than <laughs> people might think to move around. So that's that's kind of that's fun to hear. Um, I guess maybe let's also set the foundation on what IndieGG is for those who might be less familiar. So I guess, could you just describe what IndieGG looks like today and what its mission is? So IndieGG, we, when I s spoke with Gabby and Sandeep, uh, Sandeep of Polygon, Gabby of PyGG, uh, my only submission was that the guilt as it defined in 2020, 21, maybe 22, that model, this is a broken model. And that model uh, is something which has its own nuances and baggage. That's why I don't even like to call ourselves a guild. We are truly a DAO uh, in, in, in its true steady state. We would be a, a gamers nation, gamers nation from emerging market, which are running its own organization, own country, and they will have their own governance, they will have their own voting, and that's why it's a decentralized organization, which I'm imagining. Uh, I, I see myself and my team today as the catalyst to achieve that steady state as a custodian of this gamers community. And that's how we are envisaging and envisioning. And closer home, I will feel very fulfilled if we can really create a 10 million earners in India alone from the global gaming uh, uh, publishers, developers, and if Indian gamers could really become uh, and partake in making India the digital goods factory for the global games, given that gaming is going to really create a huge amount of uh, asset creators, um, the Web3 gaming is all about ownership of those assets. And with the 500 million plus gamers who have disposable time and skill, 
we believe that india and other emerging markets could become a digital goods factory for the global games that's really interesting i want to go back to something you said towards the beginning of that answer which was that um i mean you don't view yourself really as a guild more as a dao and you you came in recognizing that part of the early guild system was broken you were saying um what what was broken and what what have you been trying to to fix there so Aaron, i think all of us who have been in gaming for more than a decade and who have seen freemium growing we understand that you need to get a lot of users in the game funnel and then really create certain hooks which can lead to progression engagement retention and then monetization um, if your whole business model is dependent on a upfront paywall which in form of nft you want people to buy and then play and you are kind of really hoping to make quick buck as a game developer or a publisher what you are missing out that if that nft is a publicly listed nft uh, and if the prices go up the the friction for the new users to get into the game is too high and the new users will not come and if new users don't come there is no demand and then the price of that listed will go down and your existing users will also leave so you can't really build a business model on a very short term uh, initial paywall revenue and if that game design is not working guild model which was based to be a a, a capital uh provider or a, or a, or an investor model in which you will kind of buy um those nfts at cheap price give it to the community they may earn from renting but you will run you will make money from speculative earning that model will be broken because what you are building on is on a foundation which was weak uh so from a very simple perspective uh the what i truly believe the freemium way of game will continue to happen at certain juncture in the game progression you will introduce asset ownership and then you will introduce further the the marketplaces within the game for people to exchange those assets and that's how i call it web 2.5 and that's how i've been saying in since 2021 in bull market people like me were not heard in a winter market there is some more resonance of <laughs> right um so i mean at navic we have argued that um, clearly many of the early so-called play-to-earn games were unsustainable to begin with, just in terms of how their economies were structured, right? Because of many of the reasons that you just laid out. Um, and typically, <laughs> whenever you build another business on top of a business that is unsustainable, that business is also going to be unsustainable too. And we've seen that, right? A lot of guilds have been forced to evolve. Many are struggling, many are going out of business, and um, everyone else is trying to figure out, you know, what is the step forward to survival? Are the guilds of the future going to look anything like the guilds of the past? And so I thought it was interesting that, you know, you were in, in saying your vision for NDGG to really become a digital factory um, for the world in a lot of sense. I just kind of want to tie that into another question, which is, um, like, what is your vision for play to earn in the future? Like, like, what is the sustainable model that makes sense if we even want to continue using that phrasing? And then how does your vision for NDGG to become, you know, like a digital asset factory fit into that vision of play to earn? So, Aaron, if you look at it, any economy, whether it's a virtual economy of a game or if it's a real world economy, if it is net extractive in nature, that economy is not going to really work. As simple as that. If, right, right. if I'm in the game just to kind of extract from within the game, then who's paying? And if the game has to pay, means investors have to pay, and then the music will stop someday. So that, that model is not a circular economy model. And it can't work in a real life in a country. If India were to kind of really say all Indians are not paying taxes, but they are just taking from the coffers of government a social security, and there is no tax which government can really get from the economic activity which is happening, how will the government say survive? So it's the same thing. So my view is that there has to be a subtler loop. The, in freemium, we have a beautiful model. We have 
roughly around 900 billion dollar business which is happening on people wanting to really pay in the game for assets they want to pay for either competitive or for progression or for collaborative multiple psychological reasons they pay uh, today the only thing is they don't own assets uh, tomorrow they can own assets but the psychological frameworks don't change now aaron may be hugely skilled he has a time he can create a good so good manufacturer is not the developer good manufacturer is aaron and manish who would love to kind of really get that large ammo box in an fps may not have patience to grind or does not want to kind of really do it he may kind of rent it from you and then he can really build on top of it whatever he needs to do it so in my opinion the basic principles don't change and i believe that the three things the more number of transactions the frequency of transactions of and the size of revenue per thing will change because when you look at ownership then your mind is looking at investment versus an expense today which is happening so this shift from an expense to investment is what will increase the overall economy in the game and hence even if the developer stake rate goes down the developer would be net net more beneficial and the community will make money so that's what i believe and that's what uh, the game design needs to first have fun then needs to have right progression hook what we used to say when we used to design games in 2012 13 when the freemium really started is easy to pick up and play see it's seemingly easy to master but difficult to master and that game design principle doesn't change uh, all you are saying is the role of the game developer is to kind of really create those infrastructure for workshop for people to build on it rather than building itself so that's my that's my thinking and that's why i said that if you're creating a workshop infrastructure there are millions of indians who really have uh time and skill to create new designs to create new assets and if those assets are with me belong to me and the key operating principle here is interoperability and that's the something which i keep harping that for this vision to really fulfill interoperability across chains across games will happen otherwise you will end up having new sort of ecosystems and new new sort of landlords that interoperability has to be really built otherwise this is this this is will remain a pipe dream of of really having an asset ownership which is truly yours uh, mm. otherwise we all know the platforms like facebook were fiduciary platforms became owners and if if the chains will replace uh, facebooks and googles and apples that's what is going to happen if you don't really create interoperability right yeah that's really interesting um and interoperability of course is a is a big ask that's really complicated that's going to take time to to play out but i know we see a lot of a lot of teams both on the infrastructure side and on the the gaming side start to take some initial steps in that direction um a couple questions more about um indie gg before we we kind of shift to some other topics um the first off is i'm curious how all of what you just said um, like practically manifest itself in a business model. And if that business model is really showing yet, or if you need more time for what you just said to play out for you know, uh, uh, an entity like Indie GG to, to really find its stride. So what is the, the business model of Indie GG today? And are you thinking that that's going to change? I suppose. Uh, what we have looked at and done is, we we are saying hey what do we what do we have in a gamer fundamentally a disposable time and a disposable skill today the disposable time and disposable skill has no meaning in terms of economic benefit um, they come and play the game data is either captured by centralized ad exchanges or by the publishers and when a developer is today spending anywhere between it's a 40 billion dollar spend which gaming companies do on consumer acquisition retention esports community all of that but that money is going to centralize companies and centralized platforms where it's not coming to the gamer our view is that one the old guild model was assets and earning from assets and renting from assets and that's where you will create gamers we are saying that that is going to take time the quality of games needs to really really have those many hooks and that would change over 18 24 36 months so it's not there today um, it will evolve in the time period how do we really leverage the need of a game developer publisher and a gamer 
what you are doing is you are saying that hey listen you have multiple things in which you want to do with the community you may want to really have clan chiefs you may need to have community managers you may want to have people who are really player liquidity uh, you might want to have tournament host you might want to have influencers streamers you might want to have really testers so these are all the things which you are really kind of spending money instead of giving to the companies why don't you really give it to the gamers which understand your genre and we can give you a cohort of fps rts sfg ccg whatever and these guys are already the gamers which understand they love to discover new games while they are playing games they are having fun if they can do the quests which you are giving uh, then they can make money so we are saying that while the earning from within the game economy may take time but outside the game economy there is a need which every game developer small or big has and there is a community which can really fulfill that need why don't we create a, a direct connection between game developer and gamer for them to really create economic value of which directly goes to economic value for the gamer directly funded by the game developer gotcha um, that's the model which is kind of really working well to answer your second question uh, it's not something which is thesis we have roughly around 15 odd games uh, which are uh, in january which have really interacted with the community directly uh, we created 14000 unique people which earned from these game developers uh, we delivered roughly around 26000 quests which the community did um, so so it's already kind of a motion uh, uh, things in motion and we are getting more and more game developers excited now why are they excited i think that's a simple question when you start when you pay to a facebook or a google you pay it for the top of the funnel the 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 progression risk is yours um here in the quest you can design that uh i will give you for level 1 level 5 level 10 level 20 level 30 level 50 level 100 and for each level if you complete now as you move as anybody who is done gaming understand as you grind up you just can't grind up by by putting time you need to have time and skill you need to start really knowing the game and that's why it's not that you are only get you are un, you are getting mercenaries but you are getting gamers of that genre who are skilled because then only they can really progress deep into the game and they can make money and that's what the gamers game developers are really liking it right Uh yeah that's really interesting. Um one one final question before we we switch gears a little bit is I'm just curious what does it mean to be a member of Indie GG if you're part of the community if you're part of the DAO um what are you doing like like what are you doing what does that experience look like how do you interact with each other So there's a very interesting model which we have followed and uh India is a very thriving micro community culture you have games club in colleges you have gaming cafes you have streamers who are really having their own micro community and these micro communities hang together they play tournaments they they play lan games they they really do that and each of these micro community has some kind of a clan chief or leader and so what we are doing is we are kind of really attracting these clan chiefs we are saying that hey listen this is a new gamers nation being built you can be the guys who are building this and you will have economic benefit you will have power and you will have fame because these are the three drivers of human behavior earning power fame so these clan chiefs are then kind of working with their community to do so for an indie gg gamer it means that you can get access to quests access to tournaments access to indie gg physical meetings and that really creates a sense of belongingness sense of tribe and that's what we are really driving and but you are kind of really oscillating between the all aspects of maslow uh, when you are part of a micro community gotcha um and i want to to double click into the the india part of this and just talk about the focus on india um i guess first of all is there anything unique about the web3 gaming opportunity in india compared to other parts of the world that listeners should know about so there are two aspects of india and why it is an unfair advantage for an entrepreneur like me sitting in india it is the 500 million gamer base um spending 22 to 27 minutes per day and if you were to further kind of go up second level you have 100 to 150 million multiplayer gamers 
which are spending 60 to 90 minutes a day and they already have their teams and they already have micro communities and clients and all that structure in place. So for us, any slice and dice you do of any pivot, you'll still end up a large cohort, which is attractive for a global game developer of that size. So I think that's that's really the advantage which we have. Uh, and that's why it could be the world's digital factory, uh, because you have so much of cumulative time there. Um, but however, what one needs to be very, very cognizant of that in India, there is a consumer behavior uh, of, let's say, the biggest friction is that if you want to get 10 million people on chain, you can't get them on MetaMask. You need to simplify the onboarding friction. And the dominant behavior is a mobile number OTP verification. So that's what at India AG we have built our wallet, which is just a pure mobile number OTP verification. The second thing is, the statutory conditions in India make it make the the crypto assets ownership somewhere people get scared and they really don't want to kind of really own that. And that's what again off ramping conversion is what we are solving as an IndiGG. So both on ramping as well as off ramping of, of earnings is what we are really working together so that we can get more and more web two gamers on web three and then create huge amount of player liquidity for chains and games which are on those chains. And that's why we are really seeing a lot of chains working with us because that's where the mass adoption of, of Web3 can really be driven. Interesting. That's that's really well said. Um, maybe to, to um, connect this to a structure-related question, why was NDGG set up initially as a sub-DAO of, of YD, YGG? I'm curious... Like what? What does this structure unlock for you, and being able to to better tackle the Indian market? So, Aaron, there is a history to it. Um, Sandeep of Polygon and YGG, uh, Gabby of YGG, uh, they really kind of thought that they should look at India as a great market, and they should kind of really do that. And this is a twenty-one uh, September time frame. And that's when these guys were kind of really looking at how to do what to do. And Sandeep is a close friend and we, we discussed about it. And their whole thing was that YGG model is working because it was a beautiful time period of, of, of that. And let's quickly launch something about NDGG and leverage the, 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 uh, the familiarity of the, of the people around the guild model rather than trying to create a new model. While People like me had reservations, but we kind of really do. And this is not something which I was kind of leading it. And I was working with Nazara and, and looking at my own Nazara business. But I was working closely with Sandeep and, and Gabby on this particular aspect. Uh, I think by March, April, when the whole Axie Infinity started coming down of 22, and then everybody was clear. And it became clear that by GG model, as I mentioned, will not be the most optimal model and hence IGG, NDGG model is not an optimal model. And by the time I had kind of really built my own thesis, which is a thesis I just articulated, and I shared this with Sandeep and Gabby, and I told them that this is my thesis on way forward of gaming DAOs and communities, and that's how we should really look at. Uh, and I'm very keen to kind of really take it forward as an independent venture. And uh, given the relationship, they said, listen, it's such a nascent space. It's just still evolving. Why don't we just work together rather than really you creating something new? And for me, uh, my my belief is that uh, partnerships, goodwills are a great way to kind of really build businesses. And IndieGG was already kind of there. And that's how I, I what I've done is I've raised money separately and then I've acquired IndieGG brand uh, so that it really kind of fits in and we continue to have the goodwill of the Web3 ecosystem and IndieGG brand, but build completely new thesis. So practically, if you see it, it is not a sub-DAO of YGG. YGG has really built a beautiful network of gamers across the world. They have amazing capability and access to reach to global games, global chains. And that is something which is invaluable and priceless. And that's what we really dip into. Um, there is a beautiful sharing of ideas which happen. This thesis is what Gabby loves. And we are building a product tech stack, what we call IndieGG stack. And maybe that stack could be of use to YGG and other uh, family members. 
So it's good to be part of a family which is David passionate about communities. But I think that's where it is. This the sub DAO thing is not something which we are really carrying it forward. Gotcha. Um, I'm curious what you've learned about working in a DAO <laughs> structure, which I imagine is very different from your your previous role where you were, you know, CEO of a publicly traded business. Um, to you know, now as we were we were briefly talking before recording, you don't have C name titles. Um, you know, you have a very like community first um, ethos to how um, you know being stewards for assets and the in the community. Um, and so I'm curious, just based on how different it is, like what have you learned going from one world to to now this one? Aaron, I think the first and foremost is that your mental framework has, and that's what I was telling you before the call that uh, you are the custodian of the community. And at this juncture, you are doing the heavy lifting of, of, of building the foundation, building the right springboards so that the playbook can really evolve. And, and you are kind of also putting together the right team members, right community, uh, initial believers in the community so that they become your spine. And, and then your spine is stronger. It can grow. I think that's fundamentally it's, uh, uh, we, we don't own any equity in the company. I think that's the first big thing. Like when you come from a public listed company, you own investors own equity, you own equity, you, you do that. Here, there is no equity which I own. Uh, my, 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 if, if the community really gets, creates wealth, the investor will create wealth, I'll create wealth, right? So I think that's the fundamental thing which we have put together, that there is no corporate of interest in anybody's value creation across the chain. Um, the second thing is constantly working with community, uh, whether it's about your design of your esports IP championship logo or working about new content ideas. It's such a beautiful experience. You just put out to the community and then the community daily picks it up. In fact, as we speak, uh, some of the community members wanted to work on our website design. They said, listen, we want to revamp it. Go ahead, do it. So some of those things is what we are kind of really I'm learning, and actually it's 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 more uh, freedom I'm feeling, right? Because the degrees of freedom, the 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 ability to experiment uh, without really worrying about um, the in, the stakeholders which are closed or stakeholders is not there. So I think a lot more transparency is what we are really in, I'm enjoying personally. Yeah, that sounds great. Um... I yeah, being able to work with the community and have that turbocharge many many elements of your business versus you know being at an arm's length and more of a corporation setting um, that is a really cool unlock. I think I think just one more point on that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Your, your since you are working with community so closely, uh, your feedback loops are much faster. They're much as I, and 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 you are able to kind of respond, do things, course correct or accelerate is much, 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 much faster. And I think that's where I am coming from Web2 to Web3. When I was in Web2, I used to read and hear that a week is a year in Web3. And now I'm understanding why it is a week is a year because your community feedback and loops are much faster. Gotcha. I'm curious if there are any drawbacks that you've been experiencing in this DAO structure, because you obviously get the benefits, but given it's a completely new structure, are there any challenges that you're you're trying to work through that you didn't anticipate or maybe that you did? Aaron, I think one of the things which I am very clear is that when you are building, you need agility and the decision making, if you were to make it completely decentralized, it will paralyze you in all aspects. So what you need to be clear is that it's a progressive decentralization. It is not a full 100% decentralization. And as long as that concept is clear that there are certain items which you will kind of put to the community, certain items you will take actions within your internal community of your community teams, and certain you will just kind of take it and run with it. So those kind of decentral, um, uh, the progressive decentralization is important. Otherwise, there are so many unknowns unknowns in this space that you will not be able to tackle with them in a fully decentralized structure. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Let's go ahead and, and shift gears and talk about games, Sam, which is, of course, the backbone of uh, much of this entire business. Um, and 
you know, one striking thing that I've quickly picked up on when when studying NDGG and looking at all of the 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 org's news flow is how many partnerships you have struck over the past year. Um, I'm curious, Manish, what do you typically aim for these partnerships to look like? And what are you hoping that they accomplish for NDGG? So the good thing is that we have, we are sitting in a market which everybody is excited about. Um, large market, uh, high growth market even in Web2. So we don't have to really kind of go and tell people why why India. The, and the second thing is our team is a pretty kind of bunch of kick-ass guys who, who have great relationship with multiple blockchains and game developers. So our ability to kind of really have meaningful conversation and dialogue is good. The third thing is we have built a lot of um, programs which we are really working with global game developers just to help them on community feedback. Like one of our program is we have from community, very strong testing team of 15, 20 people, uh, which have structured feedback and they give it to different, different games. And that really kind of creates a very, very kind of a feedback loop for the game developers, which they love it because it's an invaluable feedback, which they're getting without any uh, encourage of cost or any kind of time. So for us, these kind of initiatives have helped in building relationships. We have, as of January, we have 106 partnerships with different games. Out of that, maybe 40, 44 have been live in Alpha, Vita or launched. And that we are working with these guys to kind of really figure out uh, what do they need from the community for their life stage at which they are. And different game studios at different life stage would have different needs. And that's how we really work with them as a bridge between the community and these game developers so that we can bring them the curated cohort and the right set of quests which the community and the game developer really needs. So from our perspective, uh, we really, really are very bullish about the both the quality of games which are coming and the great teams which are working in next 12 to 18 months. Uh, one thing which I have noticed and which to your earlier question, what has been something which has been learning is that I come and last 11, 12 years, I've spent on mobile first, mobile thinking. Uh, and maybe the game pipeline of next 12 to 18 months or 24 months is more PC than mobile. But the beauty of our market is that it's such a large PC gaming market also that we would be able to offer right cohorts to the game developers. Interesting. Um, I'm also curious how these partnerships have changed over time. Um, so, for example, I've I've noticed that, you know, obviously in the early guild days, it was treated very much as an investment where these guilds would, you know, they had a, a lot of money that was that was raised or earned from these um, play to earn games. And they used that money to then, you know, buy tons of assets and. Um, invest in in games companies and of course part of the reason for that was to earn yield on those assets by giving them to community members a lot of that didn't work some of it was also just through owning you know nfts in games that weren't let yet live yet or land that wasn't yet live um and that asset allocation you know proved to be problematic um and so i i imagine most guilds have have changed course from from operating in that way. But I'm curious how NDGG, how you've kind of viewed your asset allocation and how that has evolved over the past year as the industry evolved. Is it mainly partnerships? Do you invest? I'm just curious if you could break that down a bit more for That's us. Right. I think you were, you were absolutely right. There was a phase of last two years where every guild was acting as an investor, whether in native tokens or NFTs or both. And then depending upon the treasury functions, you're kind of really generating your income. I think that model uh, has really gone, right? Um, everybody has kind of really become more prudent in their investments, more conscious about their cash reserves, and also really very, very critical in their evaluation of what kind of games and what kind of game teams. Uh, at NDG, we changed it last six months back. We stopped any investment. Uh, because we just said that we need to first 
look at a very strong uh, IC investment process driven by an IC. And we are going to really drive our investment into very selective teams and also fitment of those teams with Indian gamers and Indian market. Because we are not a financial investor. We are an operating company which is looking at investing into games for the strategic benefits and advantages rather than just financial gains. So I think that has been a very, very fundamental shift since August. I started looking at into 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 DDG and, and figuring it out. Uh, from a perspective of uh, how does our partnership look like? As I mentioned, our partnership today is more about uh, what does the game developer needs? Does it need a player liquidity? Does it need a retention engagement through tournaments? Does it need a huge awareness? Or does it need a Discord community? Or does it need a huge amount of influencers? So this is a very, very, very simple discussion with game developers that what do you need from the community? And how can I can we be your help to build that community locally in India? Uh, so we are not really focusing so much on the assets, the games which are good, which are which we really believe have a potential for uh, assets and owning those assets. We will be happy to invest. We'll con- we will we are looking at investing on them, or games which are really giving those NFTs to our gamer gaming community against their time and skill. We are accepting that. Uh, but with a lot of caution because we are the custodian of the gamers' earnings and our gamers' community, and we do not want them to really get burnt. So that's how our approach has been. Understood. Um, I'm also curious um, what you now look for in these games. I mean, obviously, team is important, being aligned on on mission and what you can bring to the table and opening up. Um, serving those developers, as you were saying, and opening up the Indian market to them, that's important. But I'm curious about like the actual game itself. Um, what you as an organization are now looking at, or if you've narrowed in on any zones that you're particularly excited about. So if you look at it, there are, there are two ways to look at it. One is the game genre. And for us, what are the big game genres which Indians love? Let's kind of find. Let's first look at them. Whether it's a first-person shooter, whether it's a MOBA, whether it's a, a real-time strategy game, whether it's a racing game, or whether it's a hyper-casual game or a skill game. So these are the four, five, six categories which which Indian gamers love. Uh, where is the potential for these gamers to ultimately become players, so that ultimately the game can really benefit from Indian gamers and stroke players. So that's one criteria. Second criteria, which is the most important criteria, is is the game fun to play? Does the game have certain amount of progression? And that's what our team really kind of plays. And that's where the community comes into picture. The DAO comes into picture because now we have 1,100, 1,300 people who kind of really play these games and they can really tell us very quickly that they would like to play it again or not. So for us, the community feedback is the feedback which we decide which game to take and which game not to take. Uh, if the game is really kind of community is not excited, uh, then we kind of politely tell the game that this is the feedback which you have received from the game gaming community and we'd like to uh, respectfully pass on it. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's so interesting to see how <laughs> how rapidly the the type of game has shifted over the past year, which I imagine makes it a pretty challenging um, oper- like it's just a challenging space to to operate in to try to figure out, um, uh, you know, what are, what are the right economic structures? What are the right you know game designs that kind of fit into these forms of economies? And like, how does that fit for for your specific market? Um, just all of the changes going on um, so rapidly, I imagine, it makes it tough. I'm curious, how have you? Um, Internally, how do you try to keep on top of the the rapidly changing environment to help make good decisions around this? I think the good thing in our business is we are a distribution platform, if you were to kind of abstract out. We are a distribution platform which is kind of really giving global game developers access to Indian game community. So for us, um, any further evaluation which is towards benefit of gamers, which is towards fun of gamers, which is towards engagement of community is a, is a welcome thing. And 
the process which I describes our endeavor is to find such games constantly because the more such games come, the better, the, the larger the community gets engaged uh, and becomes large and we can really keep building distribution rates. So for us, this is something is an evolution. The pace of evolution is exciting because the faster it happens, the better it is for us. Um, so that's where we are. And that's one of the reason why uh, we are very clear that we are not a game developer. We are not going to develop a game. Uh, there are thousands of people better than us who are building games across the world. Let's kind of really give them an uh, amazing set of cohorts for them to access. Mm. Makes sense. Um, let's go ahead and shift towards our, our wrap-up questions here. Um, and my my first one, which is sort of a final question about IndieGG, is just as you look over the next couple of years, what do you what do you drill down into as like your top two or three objectives? Like what are what are like the very top guiding forces that you're looking to navigate the future? Aaron, uh, in the beginning of the conversation, I said I like multidimensional problems, right? Uh, if you look at it, this is not this is not a you know, venture just to kind of overnight call yourself unicorn and be happy. That's, I think I've done this and I've, I've led a company which at peak was $1.2 billion value. So that's not something which is super, super bucket list item. Uh, for me, what is important is that if we can really create social impact in emerging markets, starting with India. Uh, today, the largest organizations which in India are kind of employing 1.2, 1.3 million people if we could really kind of make it 10x our nurse from this wind DAO, and we can create 50, 500,000 micro entrepreneurs from this DAO, I think that is something which would be an amazing outcome in five years, which I would be very, very excited about. So for us, the North Star metrics is the unique earners per month. And that's what we are kind of really going towards. And we believe that the it's, it's not something which is pie in the sky. Uh, even just a 4 or 5% market share of current spends of gaming companies, if we are able to kind of give it to the gamers, this number would happen. Very cool. So, so that's, that's, that's something which is, which is the core purpose for us to, for me to write this thesis and, and really kind of jump into it. Uh, second thing is, for this to really happen, the enabling policy policy framework uh, needs to really kind of improve in India. Today, uh, clarity around virtual digital assets, how does really kind of uh, virtual digital assets are different than the cryptocurrencies? They are uh, they are regulative and they are they are they are not speculative or not have one, only speculative role. That kind of a Thing which I would love to kind of build this ecosystem and policy initiatives take three, five, seven years. So you need to have patience and perseverance. So to me, solving that is an input to be able to achieve this vision of social outcome and creating so much of employment. I think the third piece is I believe now with this kind of market and India market growing, a huge amount of in the next three, five, seven years, well, what happened in China, the content created for China was very domestic. It was based on domestic themes. I believe India with its amazing culture will have those kind of content, but not today, maybe five years, but that's how by that time we should have an amazing amount of community, which is penetrated into small towns and we could support the local developer ecosystem to create amazing amount of games. And then uh, with the power of the domestic market, they could really become global uh, gaming companies. Awesome. Well, I could talk about <laughs> the details even more on all of this, these these areas all day, um, but we unfortunately do need to wrap up. And so my final question to you, Manish, is that if anyone wants to follow you and follow and learn more about IndieGG, where should they go? Indie.gg, our website, and my Twitter handle is Manish Diesel, D-I-E-S-E-L. Great. Awesome. Well, Manish, it was an absolute pleasure talking with you today and learning um, from you about all things um, 
gaming web three in India. Um, uh, really excited to see how both that entire side of the market as well as Indie GG specifically play out. So so best of luck as you go and um, build out this future. And thanks for joining the Navit Gaming Podcast. Thanks, Aaron. And I would love to have you in India very soon so that you can see all of this in action. That'd be super fun. Um, well, until then, Manish, thanks for joining. If you enjoyed today's episode, whether on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, or give a five-star review. And if you want to reach out or provide feedback, shoot us a note at podcast at novic.co or find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, if you want to learn more about what Novic has to offer, make sure to check out our website, www.novic.co. There, you can sign up for the number one games industry newsletter, Novic Digest, level up your insights with our premium research platform, Novic Pro, or contact us to learn about our wide-ranging consulting and advisory services. Again, that is www.novic.co. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.